Hi, I'm Steve Banker, Service Director for Supply Chain Management at ARC Advisory Group. I'm here with Bruce Welty, the CEO of Quiet Logistics. Hi, Bruce. Thank you for agreeing to talk to us. Hi, Steve. Thanks. Um, Bruce, can you tell us a little bit about your third-party logistics company, just uh, at a high level, who you are, how big you are, what, what your niche is? Sure. Yeah, we're a five-year-old uh, company now, and we provide fulfillment service uh, mostly for e-commerce companies that ship uh, apparel and fashion and other uh, accessories on the web. And you've grown very fast. Yeah, we've doubled every year. Yeah. And what makes your company most interesting, I think, is I've been in a lot of 3PL warehouses, and there's very little automation. And you're actually using the Kiva robot. So if you could address both why is there so little automation in, in the th third-party logistics warehousing, and maybe tell us a little bit about those Kiva robots. Yeah, well, the third-party logistics business is uh, hard to predict. It's hard to look forward and make assumptions about what your business will look like, what kind of customers you're going to get, and what kind of products they'll ship. So you can't really make a five-year plan. And um, the contracts, uh, are on, on, on average, are about 3.7 years. So it's hard to make an investment and in, um, get the payback in 3.7 years. So typically, the automation, automation solutions that are out there today um, until we looked at these robots. They were generally so inflexible that if you were to implement them, uh, you couldn't reuse them for other customers. So um, I would say most third-party logistics companies think about solving their problems with labor. And when you, you say lack of flexibility, I guess what you mean is you put it in and it's, it's uh, designed for a certain scale and a certain productivity and then if you lose that customer or you get another customer, you have a hard time scaling up and down. Is that the basic idea? Yeah, kind of like that. It's, it's like the, product, the, uh, the products that they use in material handling are designed for a particular form factor. And uh, if you try to dumb it down to the point where it can be workable for every form factor, it sort of loses its value. So it, it just doesn't really work. Um, what we liked about the robotic solution was that uh, it was a reusable solution and it had all sorts of flexibility around for form factor and it didn't lose its productivity. And we can move it and we can uh, pick it up and take it with us if we need to expand, which we've done actually twice now, um, moved it into new buildings. And uh, we find it to just be uh, as flexible as, as labor. And uh, the business has grown we, and we've grown our, our capability along with our business in parallel, um, almost linearly. So as we get more business, we just add more capability. So, but when you think about e-fulfillment, you think about a really big seasonal surge. So if you have to add robots for the cross Christmas surge, then you've got them under, and, and I'm, I'm guessing they're pretty expensive, then you've got them underutilized for a number of months, don't you? Yeah, and our approach to that is uh, we, we try to be smart about that. What we try to do is buy what we need to do our, our a little bit more maybe, five to 10% more than what we need to do our normal volume. And then when we get into the rush periods, we uh, use more labor and more outside storage. So instead of trying to buy to the um, peak, we actually buy to the normal volume and then address peak in other ways. Mm -hmm. So can you describe sort of how labor works with with the robots during these peak surges? Yeah, well the, the great thing about robotic technology that we're seeing these days is that it's better, uh, it enhances human productivity. So we like to think of it as an enabler as opposed to a replacement. Um, so in our case, um, we just keep adding uh, people to, to deal with peak times, and we just keep trying to make better and better use of the robots. Okay. And I was very surprised to see your little company on uh, 60 Minutes. So uh, has that been good for business? And what were you discussing? Could you just remind us what you were discussing on 60 Minutes, what the uh, theme of that story was? Sure. The theme of that story was interesting. The overarching theme was are robots taking away jobs and changing the nature of our 
in a middle class. And I don't think the jury's uh, ruled on that yet, but my sense is um, that it definitely is making uh, some negative, some positive changes. One thing we've noticed is that it is making us more competitive in the world, and some statistics I've seen have shown that we're actually creating jobs again. Uh, in addition, we have a whole new class of, of worker that's entering the middle class now. Because so much business is moving to e-commerce, these jobs didn't used to exist before. Most people did that part of the business themselves. They would go to the store and pick the goods up and transport them home, and now we have to do that for them. So um, I think what was happening with that, uh, with that e um, 60 Minutes report was that they were trying to figure that out. What are the implications of that? And I don't think anybody knows yet. And is, do you have a sense, do you have a belief whether this is good for jobs in America or not good for jobs? Uh, well, personally, I think it's good um, because I think we're creating a whole new industry, creating and building robots and maintaining them and supporting them, which is actually good work. Yeah. And then we're creating a lot, making it easier for people to buy on the web, which makes more jobs for the people that prepare those orders. Right. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Bruce. This is uh, Steve Banker from the ARC Advisory Group talking to Br Bruce Welty about robotics and warehousing. Thanks. Enjoyed it.